Hello, everyone. My name is Sam Koplovich, and I'm the chair of the Edmonton Jewish Film Festival. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's talk. Before we begin, I would like to thank all of the many sponsors and donors who make the film festival possible. We are very grateful for their support. You will find a list of all their names in our program, which is available in a printed version as well as online. I extend special thanks to Schachten Film Sponsor, the Holocaust Education Committee of the Jewish Federation of Edmonton. The Edmonton Jewish Film Festival wishes to respectfully acknowledge that our festival is held on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous groups, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories languages and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. A few other quick points before we get started. Your sound is muted. Please keep it off so you won't disturb the speaker. We are recording the session, so remember you may be on camera or you can choose to um, cancel your camera if you want. Uh, our speaker will speak for about 35 minutes and then we will have a Q&A. You can put your questions in the chat, directing them to our moderator, Laura Schechter, at any time during the talk, and she will address them at the end. Today, we are thrilled to welcome our special guest, Thomas Roth. Thomas is one of Austria's most distinguished film directors. His film, Frankel, Damn It, We're Still Alive, a portrait of the famed Viennese pop star Falco, is one of the most successful Austrian films of the last 20 years. Thomas also directed and co-wrote the multi-award winning crime series Troutman, as well as a number of other very successful TV crime dramas. His extensive experience includes a decade as director at, I'm going to say ORF, o -R -F, the Austrian Broadcasting Corp, where he produced documentaries, music videos, and short films. Thomas is known for identifying new talent. Many of the actors he casts later go on to become stars. Schachten, his intricately woven psychological drama, released last year, has been a hit at Jewish film festivals around North America. We are very excited that Thomas is here today to speak about this excellent film. Our discussion will be moderated by my fellow Edmonton Jewish Film Festival Committee member, Laura Schechter, Associate Lecturer of English and Film Studies at the U of A. Okay, take it away, Laura. Thanks, Sam. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Special thank you, of course, to Tomas for joining us. Um, perhaps we could begin thinking through how Shechtin, um fits in with some of the other projects you have worked on. You've written and directed other projects that were focused on crime and police procedures. So did you see Shechtin fitting into those earlier projects or what more generally drew you to the film? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for screening Shechtan at the uh, Edmond Jewish Film Festival. And thank you, Sam, for this nice introduction. Um, it all started, uh, Shechtan started when I was reading the book uh, Justice, Not Vengeance by uh, Simon Wiesenthal. And uh, I was uh, shocked to learn that there were like uh, hundreds of uh, trials against Nazi criminals in Austria between 55 and 75. And compared to the amount of trials, there were only a few convictions. So I got specially interested in this case of this Mr. Kogel, um, who was uh, uh, acquitted uh, not only once, but twice, because at the first trial that took place in Linz, um, he was uh, acquitted and there was a lot of uh, uh, noise going on in the media and also outside of Austria because this verdict was so ridiculous. So they made a legal issue out of it to uh, repeat the, the trial and put it to Vienna. And uh, on the second trial in Vienna, most of the uh, uh, witnesses didn't show up anymore because they were treated like you've just seen it in the film. Most of this court scene I took actually out of the transcript of the actual court, uh, of the actual trial. So uh, I was really... Uh, yeah, shocked and um, on the other side of the dramatical aspect, really interested into, in this story or in these uh, events. And um, shortly after, after that, uh, a producer from Munich, a very young producer, Jewish producer, producer from Munich, contacted me and asked me if I was interested to hear the story of his family. Um, his family owned a 
a company in Austria. They had to escape to Paris and the company was arrearized. And in, his grandfather went into resistance in France. And at the beginning of the 60s, they came back to Vienna and they fought back their company in a trial and re arrearized it. So they got it back, which happened on very rare uh, occasions, I think. And um, so I was really fascinated by the character of his grandfather and his father, who was connected to the Mossad and did all this um, security stuff that you've seen in the film. And so those were the two uh, true facts the film is based on. And um, that really gave me the kick to start off writing the script. Uh, Laura, I can't see you anymore. Uh, are you there? No, I think she's not. I'm afraid we may have lost her. I hope she'll be coming back. So you have to take over. Sam. You want to jump in with a question, Sam? I, I didn't have anything uh, specifically prepared just yet. Uh, so um, uh, please uh, tell us tell us more about about the production itself. And and um, you you had mentioned in our pre conversation that it was low budget. It certainly certainly doesn't look low budget. I particularly love that guy's sports car. <laughs> it's, it's really, yeah, the, I wish I had a car like <laughs> the Volvo eighteen hundred. It's a Swedish car. No, actually the the the, the film uh, had a budget of. Um, uh, 2.7 million euros, which is um, very, very low. I mean, this is the average budget that films in Austria are made of. Um, and we had to shoot it during curfew. Uh, so this was uh, on top of having not so much money and um, doing this in 25 days of shooting in winter time with all the specials and fire and snow and you've seen it. Um, on top of that, it was pretty tough to do it during curfew because every one of the crew had to be tested every single day in the morning when we showed up on the location and we had to live in bubbles. We had to be uh, like in the same hotel, but on, uh, the floors were like on this floor, there was technique on the other floor, there were the actors, there were the was a director, st stuff like that. So it was very complicated to do it. And um, everybody had to put a lot of uh, heart and, and soul into it so that we that we finally uh, managed to, to finish the film and, and get it on the screen. Oh, Laura is back, welcome back. You have to oh, unmute yeah. yourself, Laura. Sorry about that. I think my Zoom just cut out for some reason, but uh, it sounds like a fascinating start to the project from what I heard in terms of trying to mix um, some fictional and some, some non-fictional elements. I didn't realize that Google was a, uh, based on a on the historical figure, oh, so yeah. that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, I was going to ask as well. I hope that this didn't come up just while I cut out. But uh, why did it seem like such an important film to make right now? And how do you see the film connecting to larger debates or conversations in Europe or in North America? Well, I think it deals with a lot of uh, themes of universal relevance. It's not only anti-Semitism, it's uh, racism, it deals with uh, uh, discrimination of minorities, um, it uh, deals with uh, emancipation, if you want, like uh, this uh, girl, Anna, who wants to find her place in society in the early 60s. So um, I think there are a lot of, of topics that still um, uh, 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 important today or in our society. Um, so um, we, we, we tried to get the, the, the financing of the film together as quick as possible. And it took us from, from, this, from the first draft of the script to, to the actual first day of shooting, like four years or something like that. So nothing goes fast when you try to finance a film. But finally, uh, all the money that we could earn in, in Austria, raise in Austria for the project, um, we got it uh, finally and, and uh, could do it, uh, shoot, shoot it um, in, uh, in, in this uh, short uh, time period of 25 days. That's wonderful. Um, speaking of the filming, uh, watching the film, I was really surprised by how stylish the setting was. and. Thank I you. think I, I should note here that um, Schechten has actually been nominated for two Austrian film awards in costume design and production design. 
Uh, and I, I think clearly people in the film community were also struck by the look of this film. It's a really beautiful film to, to look at, I think, to watch. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I was thinking about how these Holocaust survivors are financially comfortable. They're running these successful business ventures. Victor dresses impeccably, drives an expensive car. Yet, of course, running alongside that is the trauma of war and the violence of retribution in the film. So I was wondering if you could speak to that interplay of violence and style in the film, how you approach those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first thing, yes, there are those two nominations. I was a little bit um, concerned that there was no nomination for directing and the script. This has to do with the female movement here in Austria and the huge diversity movement. So to most of these uh, guys here, I'm a white haired old man. So that's that's something I'm not really happy about. <laughs> because I think that my movie has a um, quality that um, yeah, peaks out of most of the Austrian uh, stuff that comes around. But anyway, um, uh, yeah, I, th I think that the photography is uh, is 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 uh, like yeah mainstream cinema. That was uh, what I had in mind because I thought I I want to reach uh, younger audiences um, and um, there's a certain level that you have to deliver, I guess, so that it uh, is like a, like what people would expect when they go to the movies. Um, actually, I had a screening. Um, in Los Angeles in January, and um, Janusz Kaminski was trying it, who's the uh, DOP of Steven B. Spielberg since uh, more than 20 years, I guess, or since Schindler's List, actually. And he came and he uh, said that, that he was really uh, amazed by the, by the directing and the photography of the film. So this was a big honor for me. Um, to come back to your question, um, I didn't actually make my mind up about um, compare the the violence or the beauty of the shot. I, I think I just tried to stick to the script, and um, I always try to to be uh, or to deal with the uh, reality in a way. So I'd like to show it like it is or like it was, um, as close uh, to to truth or or reality as possible. So um, I tried to to show the the violence or the the, the tough parts as as clear uh, as I tried to to show this landscape, this certain places in Austria where all this um, or most of this uh, uh, racism, anti-Semitism stuff comes from. I don't know why it is that way, but most of the Nazis from Austria came from Upper Austria, where we actually shot that. And uh, yeah, I hope that that answers your question. Yeah, absolutely. And I I wouldn't be surprised if film festivals, you know, also start to perhaps give this film awards as as it continues to be released, because it it really is quite a I think quite a memorable film, and particularly I think in the the style of it and and the the mood of it, you know, I think that you really effectively built this tension among those characters and you know and I think Victor particularly seems like such a complex character at times you know really working through both being in the present 1960s and also being tied to the past and having this kind of past trauma that he's he's really unavoidably connected to yeah. and well, you know that this actor, Jeff Wilbush, I don't know if you know him, he, he was in Unorthodox, very okay. famous on Netflix, very successful. And um, I casted him in, in Berlin. He's like, he's a little bit of a globetrotter. So he, he yeah, he's a, he's a really interesting guy. And um, after thinking it over for several uh, days, I, I thought that he's the, the, the right choice to, to uh, play Victor. And the last day of shooting, we went to New York, um, as you've seen in the film probably. And um, he took his two suitcases and uh, he came to New York and he stayed and he's still in the United States. So he just came back to Austria two times to get an award for a nomination for this film. And um, now he's living in LA. He's uh, with a very huge uh, uh, agency. 
Um, he was in a series here in the States. I think it's called The Calling on Peacock. And um, so he's doing his uh, career now in the United States. And I find it's very amazing. I'm going to see him next week. So I'm looking forward to his new project. That's wonderful. I um I had read online that you are known for identifying younger or newer talents and you know that they they sometimes go on to to bigger things after they've worked with you so yeah, but I think that's a coincidence I don't know yeah. I mean, there are a lot of stuff in this Wikipedia thing that you can't control and I think people you know they want to 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 make it good or to write something that is that is that is nice for the person that they're writing about but um, I mean, yeah, it's true when it comes to Austrian actors, there were some that I really can say I, I helped them starting their career. Um, I also had this, uh, this thing um, with uh, Rebecca Ferguson, you know, she's the Lisa Faust in all these uh, Mission Impossible movies. And I was doing a, a movie in uh, Sweden like uh, 10 years ago. And uh, she she played her first main uh, role in, in this film back then this was before she was uh, casted as the white queen so if you want um, I also started a little bit the career of Rebecca <laughs> <laughs> no but it was more like a coincidence but that's well, maybe because why people write something into in, into this Wikipedia stuff I don't know yeah uh, well I mean maybe we could talk more about the casting because I I did find the casting for the film to be so wonderful. I, you know, certainly the actor who plays Victor is wonderful. The the, the actor who plays Victor's father, Paul, um, the former SS officer, Gogol, or, or or Victor's girlfriend, um, for that matter as well, Anna. Um, so I, I was wondering if you could tell us more about what qualities drew you to the actors, or you know what what qualities or skills you were looking for when you began to cast those parts um first of all i i wanted all the jewish uh, characters played by jewish actors so i thought that's that's uh, very important and um, there aren't too many in austria so this is why we were also looking around in germany and um i also really wanted uh, paulus manka to uh, take the uh, part of gogel paulus manka is a so-called uh, enfant terrible here in Austria is a, a very demanding and a very strange guy and he hasn't been in a movie since 10 years because nobody wants to nobody wants to hire him because it's very tough to deal with him so most of his spare time he spends in court because he's thrown some ashtray at some people or that's I don't know some uh, some um negotiations with a reporter or something like that so everyone said uh, don't don't touch this guy don't do it with Paulus but he finally he was very professional we had no problem at all and it was really I think that his performance really is amazing actually and neither uh, Jeff nor Paulus have a nomination for the Austrian movie awards so I really that's because you said it before so I'm wondering about that a little bit and um, Anna, she, um, Miriam Fusenegger, she, um, she's very young and she had a wonderful career so far. She, she uh, played the, at the Jedermann in Salzburg. This is the most famous theater production that, that takes place in Austria every year in the summer at the Salzburger Festspiele. And she was um, an unknown actress and was offered this huge and historical part of of the other man and she only played it one summer because then she she didn't have fun anymore with it and did something else so it was really i was uh, wondering about that uh, attitude so i i uh, met her and talked to her and then thought that she's a very good actress and a wonderful person too so it came together like like, like that yeah oh well, that's really interesting about particularly the the actor who played Gogol. he um you know that he has this kind of he's a theater actor and yeah. director he has his this play he was in la with the uh, uh, alma mala play and uh, his uh, directing they they go on for like eight to ten hours so when you come to the theater you get coffee then at the break you get the dinner 
with wine and everything and then it goes on for four more hours and it's not just one stage so it's like 10 stages you can walk around in the theater and see what's going on and go back to this character and then follow another one so um, he's a maniac in a way he has no support with the uh, public money because he's such a weird guy a tough strange guy so uh, he has to finance all the all, all the the whole production with his own money or the money that he's earning with the tickets so when you show up at the cash desk he's sitting there selling the tickets himself so <laughs> he's doing everything and so this is in a way i admire him for doing that because i think there are not too many people that would do some crazy things like that so. yeah that is really remarkable having this sort of passion project and and uh finding ways to make it work even if you're doing a lot of it by yourself perhaps and mm -hmm. you know and it's also kind of interesting like a movie director the only thing that i don't have to do is selling tickets that's right <laughs> <laughs> and it's... sometimes i think maybe i could do it better than someone else <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny too to of course hear more about these some of these actors who are so well known in austria who mm -hmm. you know as north american audiences we may not really be that familiar with i i certainly found that watching some of the other films for this film festival there are a couple with really well-known israeli actors who have been in like 45 50 films in israel they're huge but <laughs> unless you're watching those in in mainstream cinema in north america you don't necessarily know their names or mm -hmm. you know I mean, and, maybe you know this 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 guy Christian Berkeley who who uh, plays uh, um, uh, Wiesenthal, because he did some American movies like Valkyrie with uh, Tom Cruise, and he was in this film uh, with uh, Brian Cranston about this uh, Hollywood writer, and he was in L with uh, <laughs> Isabel Huppert by by uh, this uh, American uh, director. Um, so I thought maybe you're familiar with his face a little bit, or you can look him up, then you will see that he did some Hollywood pictures already. And he's very famous in Austria too, actually, or in Germany, very, very, very famous actor. And he's also a writer. He wrote two novels already, and they were also very successful. And yeah, so it's, uh, yeah, he's a star if you want. Wow, that's wonderful. Um, I, I was going to ask you as well about working uh, to get the setting of Vienna in the 1960s just right. Um, did you work with consultants to get those details or did you just do a lot of research on your own as you wrote the script and started uh, to prepare? I have a wonderful uh, art director. Uh, she's uh, working with me since like uh, 15 years or something like that. And um, we had a very huge art department with a lot of people that really tried to to make the best out of the money and of the budget. And as I said before, everyone, especially in the in the art department, really put a lot of uh, hearts and blood and soul into this so that it finally worked out. I mean, it's a bit tricky to to shoot a period movie, in, even if in Vienna, where we have a lot of historical buildings or set things that you can use but it's also tough because you have those uh, um, um, air condition <laughs> stuff you have uh, street lights you have modern cars you have all those signs on the on the buildings like shops and things like that so we helped uh, us a little bit with the cgi like that we changed it uh, with computer uh, generated uh, support but um, uh, yeah, I think I, I have please to say uh, thank you to the to the art department that really did a wonderful job. And I imagine too, in, in terms of the CGI or just making sure your shots are set in a way that um, you, you know you're not seeing like newer si skyscrapers in the in the shot or or things like that, newer mm -hmm. office buildings. You know that you also must have been fairly sure. careful about that sort of thing yeah that, that always depends then where you put the camera and which lens you put on and um so yeah it, it's tricky it's a little bit tricky um if you feel like one 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 thing added to to the cgi i mean in the in the final scene where you see jeff as an old man this is also a computer generated it was very uh very tricky to do that and uh, very uh, intense work of those guys um, because uh, we had to we filmed a very old person and tried to make a mix of Jeff's face that we 
filmed in reality in New York and put the face of the old man on Jeff's face so that he will be an old Jeff. So I don't know if I explained it right. I hope you can follow. Um, and this was something special. I think that this also worked uh, very well, actually. That actually answers a question that came up in the chat, which was about if the old man at the end of the film was actually the old Victor or if, you know, or if how, how that person, you know, came to be. So it's actually a mix of CGI. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. Thinking yeah. about blending two faces, really thinking about making it an older Jeff. That, so, that's why he's wearing this, this hat because hair is very tough to, to improve on, on the computer. Right. So um, we did some, tricks like that to to get it done but actually the face was a, an extra that we filmed here in vienna the rest we were shooting in uh, new york and uh, then we mixed those faces together wow that's really yeah that's very cool <laughs> <laughs> um, i was going to ask about how the reception has been for the film so far have you found that reception has varied in austria as opposed to other parts of the world or that jewish film festival audiences tend to respond yeah, no, I in think it, uh, overall, the reception was very, very good. I think um, it was really some of the screenings were really amazing, like uh, in New York or in LA. And it was also, to me, a surprise that uh, even in India, people were really, uh, uh, really uh, very positive. Uh, so towards the film, um, we opened in in Austria in December. And uh, it fulfilled all the expectations that we had. Actually, some of the critics were like, "This is like it is in Austria." Didn't like it so much. Other ones liked it very much. So uh, overall, I'm very happy and uh, content with uh, what we've reached with this very small uh, film. So um, it's screened in, in Edmonton. We're sitting here talking about it, so that's that's uh, something that I that I do appreciate very much, and uh, so I'm proud that um, this film found uh, its way around the world. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. Good, oh, that's wonderful. Have you, have you found that there's been any uh, defensiveness about the content or anything? Mm, no, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there were not too many politicians joining the opening night or stuff like that. Some of the media didn't uh, bring a review, stuff like that. Or now in the aftermath, like I mentioned before, comes to nominations at the Austrian Movie Awards. This is not something that uh, certain people in Austria think want to put on their on their chest, like uh, I don't know what. So. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit, but you know, I don't, I don't really make up my mind about that. It is like it is, and I'm, I'm proud of the film, and, I'm, and I think that um, it's a success. So it's um, more than we could have expected, actually. So I'm fine with that. That's okay. Absolutely, that's wonderful. And I mean, I think you're right. It has had um, quite a presence at at film festivals all around the world, and you know that mm -hmm. it is getting attention. So. I suppose even if there is a little defensiveness here and there, you know, that's that happens with all kinds of films, perhaps. I mean, this uh, distributor here in North America, Menemsha, Neil Friedman, he, uh, he he bought the film and he will bring it to, he released it in the United States in, in uh, theatrically. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I think that's also a big success. I think it will start in this fall. And uh, then I'm looking forward to like reviews in the states. So yeah, then we'll then we'll see. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I was going to say just before we open up the discussion to include more general Q and A from the other audience members here, uh, perhaps you could tell us a bit about working uh, with the actors and the crew during the pandemic. Um, did you find that COVID really? changed how you interacted with other people on the set or how you planned the schedule for filming? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, as I said before, you had to do all those testing every single day in the morning. So we started very early. So the way or the, 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 the timing from coming to the set until actually starting to shoot was a little bit longer than usually. And um, 
really really had to to take care about everything so that no one gets infected and it really worked out we had not a single infection uh, during the whole shooting in this large crew so um uh, yeah we had to you everyone gets his his food like packed into into cellophane and you have to there's like marks where you have to sit and then you have the distance to the other one and stuff like that and when lightning uh, technicians uh, come to the set to um, change the setting then everyone else has to leave then you come back with the direct and the actors and the camera so stuff like that that was really a little bit straining or like out of, of normal but um you know you get used to that and after a few days you don't uh, you don't uh, pay attention to that anymore the only thing that always is in your mind is i hope not an actor or another main uh, DOP uh, crew member uh, gets this COVID stuff. So we were lucky and uh, managed it without any with anyone getting sick. That's wonderful. Did Were you all living together in a sort of isolated bubble during the filming or? Yeah, when we were in in Upper Austria at the Salzkammergut, yeah, we were in a hotel and this was very, like uh, there was a plan where is going, where who is going to stay or sleep in which uh, part of the hotel, stuff like that. Who is driving with whom to the location? Which actors can be together, and which actors do we try to uh, uh, um, have in different places? So um, yeah, there was a there was a, a good plan of the of the production company, and they had to make up their mind a lot how to get everything done like that but finally yeah it worked out um we do have a couple of or we have one question so far um from the mm -hmm. audience mm -hmm. uh and brent uh says that the p1800 car is almost like a character uh could you talk more about that car and mm -hmm. well i think that's a good remark actually yeah it is uh, because it, in, at the beginning of the film, it starts uh, off when Victor gets this car as a gift for his birthday, and in the end, he has to burn it down. So um, to me, this is kind of an arc also of the character and the story. So, or actually, this was the idea behind it. Um, I I said to the uh, to Sebastian, who was the uh, who was a part of the uh, uh, art department, what kind of car I would like to have. I didn't have the Volvo 1800 in mind. I even didn't know that car to be true. So I was more thinking about the BMW or something like that, an old one or a Mercedes or something like that. But then uh, he came up with this car and with pictures of this car. First, I thought maybe this red color is, is, is a little bit too much. But then I thought this is the only color that we will see in that film. Like if it, if it, I tried to do a black and white movie in color, and if this is the only real color that we're going to feature, then I thought it's 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 perfect. And um, yeah, I think that that was really a, a, a good choice. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I thought the the red and the the sleekness of the car really was perfect for the character. And mm -hmm. and you know, seeing how he was, I mean, kind of literally moving through the the city, but also more figuratively how he was moving through the city in some ways as this young, stylish, mm -hmm. you know, really um, interesting sort of young man. But mm -hmm. as you say, you know, that it does, that he does burn it up at the end does also seem quite important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agree to that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have another question uh, from Sam, who asks uh, what the general discourse is like in Austria uh, today regarding the Holocaust and confiscation of Jewish property? Um, well, I think that a lot of things have uh, happened so far. So um, Austria is not like it was back uh, 40 years ago. Um, so it's, uh, especially Vienna. Vienna is a city with uh, 2 million people living here. Um, it's a multicultural city. Uh, I think very open-minded and there's a lot of culture and stuff going on. So a lot of things have, have changed as a Jewish community here that is very well respected. Maybe it is different outside of Vienna. Uh, so in smaller villages or stuff like that. But I think there is a, a right wing movement all around the world. And um, this is something that we all probably have to worry about. 
And that's not something that's typical for Austria, even though we have the FPÖ here and we have a Jörg Haider and we have a Mr. Kickl now here. But if you look at Germany, to the AfD, or if you look to Italy, where the right wings are in charge, even in Sweden, if you look at the Mr. Orban, or even if you look at your own door, Mr. Trump. So this is not something that is special for Austria, I guess. So I think this is something that worries me wherever in the world. And um, I don't know what, but then the only thing that we can do is to to really, like I do a film like that to, to show that things like that uh, still are uh, important in our society and still are relevant. And uh, so we never should stop showing this and doing films like that. Absolutely. Um, to go back to the non-fictional elements of the film, um, obviously we've talked about Simon Wiesenthal and uh, and Gökul as as based on historical figures. Uh, Karen asked if Victor is also based on a real person. Uh, parts of Victor are, um, as I said before, it's um, this producer uh, who called me Michel, um, his grandfather. His name was Victor, and his father's name is Victor too. So this character is a mixture of both. I didn't ever meet his grandfather because he's dead for since many years, but I met his father and I talked a lot to him and tried to find out what kind of character he is. Sure, I made something up for my movie so that it will work in the dramaturgically aspect or that it's like the, the, the character that I wanted to show. But parts of both of these men are in, in, in the Victor and the film. That's also where he goes by the name of Victor. And... Um, so it, there's a, there are two real persons, like I said before, this father of this Jewish producer was connected to these security guards that really uh, existed in Vienna and that really took care about the Jewish community and were not afraid to, to take weapons to, to defend the Jewish community from uh, intruders of any kind. Um, and they were really connected also to the Mossad, so that's that's true. Well, that's at least what he told me, so I believe it's true. <laughs> and um, yeah, so this uh, father and grandfather of the of the Munich producer Michel Wagner, well, uh, like the, the, the they 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 come together in this character Victor that I created. Um, also speaking of Victor, uh, Susan loved that the young Victor looked just like we would expect. Was it hard to find a child who looked so much like the adult, Victor? Yeah, that, that's always that's always tough, actually. But um, yeah, we have uh, people here, and you sure have that in Canada or in America too, that that uh, focus on children casting, and um, yeah, so we we found two or three that that uh, we thought maybe they could uh, we could get a resemblance to the uh, older Victor. Um, and then we did a casting and I talked to them. So it's always with, with children, it's always a little bit difficult. So you really have to connect to them in a way so that you get them uh, doing the things that you need in the movie. So you need to have the parents, you know, sometimes you need to have the parents around. Sometimes you, you should not have the parents around. Sometimes it's more important that he has his, I don't know, his teddy bear and, and not his mother. So, you know, you know, you have to find that out and then you can, then you can work with us, with those, uh, very, very young actors. Absolutely. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? I think, do you want to open, just open it up and let um, people unmute mute themselves since we're a small group? Does anybody want to jump in? Sure. sure. I think Karen, yeah. Okay. So I'm also wondering, you know, when you watch, first off, I thought the movie was excellent. Yes. And thank you. Very, uh, thank you. very wonderful. Thank you. Um, the problem I have, of course, is when it's based on a true story. And as you've been, you know, discussing which parts were and which parts are fic fiction. So I was also wondering, um, you know, what happened to the real Google? I did try to Google Google <laughs> and almost nothing comes up about him. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, 
I, I found one article about him. Mm -hmm. And I, so I'm wondering, did he disappear? Was his wife kidnapped? All of that. Because, mm -hmm. you know, initially when, when uh, Victor was doing all of that, I'm thinking to myself, man, that guy is Meshiga. He's crazy. <laughs> uh you know he 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 could leave already and now he's going back again and again and uh but at the end and then said, at the wow. end it's like wow was he ever brave to have done all of that so mm -hmm. yeah i was wondering what what uh happened with the real google well, family yeah i can tell you i mean uh the it, it was in my sense to have this in a way, open end of the film, so that um, audience can uh, think about or make up their own ideas, or that they discuss about what was going on in the end. So, I'm, in a way, I'm grateful for this uh, for this question um, because this is something that I really that I really um, appreciate um, about the real uh, Gogol. The thing is that we changed his first name in the movie, so his real name is Vincent. Gogol. So if you oh, if you Google the Vincent Gogol, <laughs> you probably find out a little bit more. The tragic is that he was acquitted, went back into his hometown. I think it was Bad Aussee or it was Bad Hofkastein. I'm not quite sure at the moment because it's some two or three years back that I did all the research. But uh, somewhere in Austria, where he was working as a a clockmaker, uh, repaired watches, and lived to his end. And that's it. And that's pretty tough to, to know. I mean, nobody from, from his relatives, if there are some, I don't know, uh, got in touch with us. So I think probably there's no one uh, existing anymore. But I don't know that for sure. Yes. Well, then you, uh, so was this a screenplay that you had written? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it was wonderful, really. Thank you. Thanks. And you know, I often, I will watch uh, a movie like yours. And even though I'm disappointed in reality that it didn't happen, I still <laughs> enjoyed seeing what happened. <laughs> because I wish that would have happened to say all of them. Yeah. <laughs> I understand that, yeah, yeah. yeah. He felt like that with Plan B last year. Plan A. Plan A. Plan A. Okay. Uh -huh. It was in, the, in theaters in America, right? Plan A. It had a theatrical release in America, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We did it. Did it, did. Did yeah, it get so. released yeah, I think here? So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we had I... it in the film festival last year. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. That can I just jump in? Uh, that film, Plan A, makes me think about how important it is to have, the, if the central character is supposed to be Jewish, to have someone that actually looks Jewish. And I remember you saying at the beginning that you were looking for to, for the part of Victor, someone that, that really looked Jewish. And I always find that very disappointing because, I mean, some of us can actually tell. I mean, I don't believe that you can always tell who's Jewish and who isn't, but there is just a certain manner, especially if the person is the central protagonist of the film and he's the focus mm -hmm. the whole time. There is just certain ways of holding yourself, saying things that are not really Jewish. And the hero of Plan A was clearly some German actor who <laughs> didn't look even mm -hmm. as well. I mean, he just looked German to me. And um, so he's, and he's playing the part of like, you know, uh, someone who is clearly not. So anyway, uh, I want to commend you for, for that. But I have a, my question is about the opening scene. And. Uh, when I looked at it again, I still couldn't figure out what is that that, that soldier who's lying in the snow and there's a bullet in his head. Yeah. What yeah. is that passport that he's holding? I know that it said um, Jew, a friend of Jew or something, mm -hmm. but who is that guy? Is he a soldier? Did he was was he shot while he was taking the passport from someone? Or uh, can you? Well, to, me, to me, he was someone who supported Jews that oh. hid it in the woods like the family of uh, okay. Victor, they were hiding there and Gogol and his crew, they were hunting them or searching for them to find them and to bring them to the concentration camps. And he was one who didn't play the game. So he was like hiding or helping 
Jews. So this is where Gogol got his troop shot him. I actually had a scene in the script uh, once where, where you see that or where you see that this guy is going to be uh, shot by, the, by his own people. But then I, I thought it's it's not in the focus of the story, so this is why I dropped it and later on. But um, actually, that, that was the idea that he's someone who helped Jews uh, because it's saying in his passport, a uh, friend of Jews. Huh? And um, yeah, that was the idea behind that. Nice. And I agree to what you said before to, to the to the casting. As I as I already mentioned, I I really wanted to have all the Jewish uh, characters in the script played by Jewish actors, and I also think that this is very important to get it authentically. So mm -hmm. um, we were really really uh, very very uh, into this idea to to casting Jewish actors for the Jewish parts. Well, that whole opening scene just really gives us a sense of what this boy went through. And so yeah. it, we don't have to really imagine. And, you know, I mean, it really makes it very real as to what his early life was like. And that, you know, this is part of his, what he's carrying around. Yeah, I found this also him. very, very, uh, a very tough uh, image when you see this little boy who is finding this dead body and then walks away in the coat of the SS uh, uniform uh, in, this, in this dark coat, so. I also uh, thought that this is an impact on audiences. Yeah, yeah. There's a, even the costuming. I mean, there was just so much detail in there that really makes you feel that this is, you know, there was so much reality in that whole scene. That that mountain, you know, and this, there's nobody else around. There's this body, and you can tell a whole lot has gone on that we've just entered into. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe one word to the to the snow or to the landscape. Um, actually, most of the, the the snow was really there. So uh, we had this guy from this area up there, and I said, "Tell me a village or an area where there is snow in January to one hundred and fifty percent." And I said, "I don't want to stand there and have no snow, and we don't have the money to make it." Uh, okay, we can fix something in the computer. Like if there's one or two places in the in the in the whole image where there's no snow, we can add snow to that. But you know, basically, we need the snow. And he said, "Where there is one, this one." Village, it's called St. Gilden at the Wolfgangsee. And they always have snow, believe me. So we said, okay, we'll do it there. And really, the day we arrived, it started to snow. To snow. So it was really magic. <laughs> well, the, and this they, is where we got all these yeah. wonderful images. The atmospherics all the way through the film, from the opening scene until the holes, all the stuff at the end. I mean, really, you just feel you're really in that landscape. You did a marvelous job with the cinematography. Mm -hmm. and Setting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I was impressed with how well that Volvo did on the snowy roads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a Volvo. It comes from Sweden and it's, it's it's used to have snow. So yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, most of the most of the time it was working quite fine. There is one scene where you see in the movie that there are uh a train on the yeah, so but um, yeah, no, most of the time it worked out very well, actually. That's a good car. <laughs> yeah, they are. I've had two of them. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Not so anymore. Know. Not anymore, but I, yeah, yeah. Thomas, I have a question. I, I think it can always be a little bit intimidating to touch upon Jewish history. Did, did you have a lot of historians working with you to make sure that you got things just right? Actually, no. Uh, I relied all the time to uh, Michel and his father. Like uh, when there were some things I needed to know, I addressed them and asked them. There was also at this uh, 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 scene at the cemetery, this guy who is uh, the who is uh, doing or performing this whole uh, ceremony. He's the real uh, 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 guy here in Vienna who does this. So oh, nice. he's this is Mr. Batsilai, who did it and did a wonderful job. And he told me how this is going, how this is uh, uh, this ceremony um, is happening. So this is why it why it's so authentically. So um, I did not have a, an historian. I had this uh, very good uh, material from the court, like the, the transcript of the of the court scene, and most of the uh, lines of Simon Wiesenthal I took directly out of his books. Um, because they were so so fantastic and so true. I think everything that he says about victims and perpetrators and stuff like that. So I 
most of it I really took took out of his book and put it into dialogue, but it's it's his sense that it, that, that that is in this in this dialogue. So um, I think that uh, I relied on that that this is that this would work very well uh, with the Jewish topic. The scene where they where there's the large monument with i guess christ or whoever with a cross that mm -hmm. they're all that ceremony what is that ceremony now this is um like after the war all those soldiers that were together in the in the wehrmacht they build a group that's called the uh, kameradschaftsbund so that they stick together and be connected after the war because they have gone through this horrible uh uh, experiences of war and um so that they would meet one time in the week and sit together and talk about what has happened or what they're doing now and um this uh, monument is to remember all those uh, young men that lost their lives in this village where we shot it so the Kamach of Spund would go there on certain days in the year to celebrate the death and um yeah that's what we were showing but that's something probably that you're not so familiar with in in North America, because here in in Austria, everybody would know this is a a, a monument for death soldiers of World War Two. So. Well, we have the cenotaph, but it's not as explicitly religious. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is also not really. I mean, everything in Austria back in that time was very Catholic. But it's this Kamalachospun stuff is not really religious. It's like the community that stays together and keeps staying in touch after after the war. They still exist up to uh, to, to date. So even the sons of the Kamalachospun members are now uh, still together in the Kamalachospun. It's uh, in some places in Austria. I also thought it was interesting how you showed after the hunt that they had a moment of silence for the dead animals mm -hmm. and they had given more honor to those than to the Jews that they had killed and whoever else they killed. That that was my purpose actually. Yeah. Yes. I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. And to show I, I got the point. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you got it. <laughs> Yeah, the story about the white eggs and the brown eggs made me cringe. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, really you have made a wonderful, wonderful film. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody else? I think it should, I think it's should be shown in high schools mm -hmm. everywhere. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a program here in Austria where they show it in schools, actually. I joined one screening a few weeks back. Um, it was really interesting and um, also very, very, uh, very, very inspiring to hear also what young people are saying. And um, they were really, uh, um, yeah, amazed. They liked it very much. And I was talking to them like uh, one and a half hours after the screening. So I hope that it's it will be shown in schools um, in Austria over the next uh, month and um, get some get some good uh, response again from the from the children or from the youth from the young people yeah yeah because that scene with the teacher was awful you mean where the kids it's sing it? yeah oh no that was the short that, oh, that was, was, the was the short, short. that was <laughs> the short okay sorry okay, no, no, we no. watched a short where there was a teacher teaching about oh, okay. the holocaust oh I and see. then the inspector came in and was they giving didn't her want her to, time. They didn't yeah. want her to teach so much. She was teaching too much. Does anybody else have a question before we wrap up? There's a lady I here. Just, here. I just wondered, is there any plans to, uh, has it been bought by Netflix or Amazon Prime or any kind of mainstreaming venue? Uh, no. Not so far. Um, I expect to to get uh, in touch with them when the film will be released in in North America. The distributor, um, Mr. Friedman here at Menemsha, they have a screening platform themselves, but it's a very small one. 
So I don't know. Uh, I hope that um, that some one of those uh, huge platforms will see the film and maybe get interested in in showing it. So let's wait. I hope so. Yes, I hope so too. It was an excellent, excellent film. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have more questions, I'll just wrap up. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Susan Schiffman. I'm coordinator of the festival. Thank you so much for being here. Thomas and Laura, that was such Thank a good discussion. Really, Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much. Take it's, care. It, was, it was so great to have so much interaction and, and all of you on the Zoom call, you've asked, asked such great questions. Uh, it is a great film. I'm so glad you all loved it. I loved it. And uh, I hope it will have lots, lots more success.